Hello. On behalf of the Churches of Christ and Christ's Way Bible Institute, we welcome you to the rebroadcast of our Monday morning class. It is our desire to assist all who are interested in various Bible and New Testament doctrines and teachings. We set as a goal one online class each Monday morning. Information and links to the live meeting can be found on our website. www.thechurchesofchrist.life on the live meetings page. May God bless your studies in His Word. Regularly, we have been studying the, from the beginning, the Genesis, book of Genesis. Today, we have the opportunity to study the new subject that's called uh, History Books, Who Can We Trust? The wonderful topic. Now, Brother um, Brian Barrett is coming and teaching the regular Bible study. Now, we warmly welcome Brother Brian Barrett for your wonderful teaching. Now, Brother Brian Barrett, take the time to for teachers. Good morning. God bless. Good morning. It's good to God see uh, all of those who have joined us. Uh, here it's morning, in some places it's afternoon, in others it's evening, but uh, it's great that through the technology that God has given to us that we can meet literally around the world to study the scriptures. One of the things that I'd just like to say is, is uh, be very careful with the settings on the uh, Google Meet app. Uh, we're going to put up the class notes here very shortly. And it's important that you not be tinkering with your microphones and cameras. Uh, it causes the notes to disappear. Last week, they dropped down uh, during the meeting, and it caused us not to be able to get a good, clear recording of the notes uh, for the Bible class. And so they have to stay up. If you press some of the settings on the meeting, it will cause the meeting notes to drop in size, and we can't recover that for uh, the video. So, so please don't uh, tamper a lot with the settings uh, as we get into the meeting. Uh, what we have been, as Brother Joseph said, uh, studying for some time uh, is the book of Genesis. And we went through that, and along with uh, the book of Genesis, we uh, have added now the idea of the Old Testament history books. And today, uh, we're going to uh, be talking about lesson two of our lesson on the Old Testament history books. And as we go through these Old Testament books, we're going to do so. Uh, the book of Romans, the 15th chapter says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. And so not only are we looking and thinking about some of the historical things that happened with God's people, but we also uh, want to be able to make an application of those things to our uh, particular life. And so today, as we look at the book of Genesis, uh, the first part of the history books, we're going to be asking a question, who can we trust? When God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, he led them into the wilderness, and they had to know that they could trust both Moses and the God who sent him. And so the book of Genesis that brings them up to date with who they are contains uh, many promises that God made, and it also contains warnings. Uh, the study guide calls them threats. I like to think of them as more so warnings that God warned people of various things. And the bottom line is, is that the things God warned them about and the things that God promised to them have come to pass. And therefore, we can truly trust that when God says something, uh, we can follow his word. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, 
beginning in verse 16. It says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, or that is the unchanging nature of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for uh, refuge to lay hope or to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. One of the things that we see in the book of Hebrews is the fact that it is impossible for God to lie. So the question is, in looking from a historical standpoint, and specifically today, the book of Genesis, is that the case? Is God always truthful with us when he warns us of things? Will they come true? And when he makes promises, will he keep those? That's important. People make promises all the time. They promise things that they have no intention of keeping. But God is not like that. In the book of Revelation, verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 5, the writer John said, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write. For these words are true and faithful. What we want to see is that can we accept the things that the Bible tells us as being true and faithful. In Revelation 22, verse 6, continuing, He said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, we are constantly uh, asked to trust in God, to believe that the things that he's telling us are true, whether they be warnings or whether they be promises. In Genesis, uh, as we start here this morning, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, says, Then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden they, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This is one of the earliest warnings that God gave to mankind. As I said, the study guide will call it a threat. I just want to think of it as God's warning man uh, to be careful in his choices. But God warned him that in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shall surely die. Now, later on, when the serpent comes to the woman in Genesis 3 and in verse 4, the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Here we have a warning of God that in the day they ate or would eat of the forbidden fruit, thou shalt surely die. The devil comes along in the form of the serpent and says, you know, ye shall not surely die. So here we have a direct contradiction. Either God is warning and telling the truth to Adam and Eve, or the serpent 
is telling the truth, or again, he is lying. But you can't have both of these things to be true. And so as we look at the account, as we've already seen, and most of us know, we have this warning. I just want to make a comment. Uh, God did not say that in the day they ate thereof, they would die that day. He said that thou shalt surely die. Wasn't necessarily the promise that they would die that day, but they would die. The devil says he shall not surely die. In Genesis 3.22, after they have ate of the forbidden fruit, the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove the man, or he drove out the man. And he placed at the east the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep, or that is to guard, or to protect the way, the tree of life. As long as man lived under God's commands, he was free to eat of the tree of life. But now that he's become a one to both do and to know good and evil, God drove him out of the garden, lest he continue to eat of the tree of life and live forever. And so here we see God keeping both his warning and his promise. When the man and the woman were cast from the garden and away from the tree of life, and the cherubim were there to keep them from returning. The process of death and dying began. In Genesis 4, verse 8, it says, And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now the warning that God gave to the man and the woman was is the day that they ate of the fruit of the forbidden tree, they should surely die or should surely die. But they didn't die that day, but death began. And sadly, it did not come to Adam and Eve first, but the first recorded death that we have is Cain who rose up against his brother Abel through jealousy of the sacrifices, and he slew him. And so death begins. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, it says, And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So here we see that God made the warning that death would come to mankind if they ate of the forbidden fruit. And now death has began in humanity and mankind and the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that, uh, and also 1 Corinthians 15, death passed on to all men and that all have sinned. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So here we have one of the first warnings that God made. Don't eat of the forbidden fruit or you shall surely die. They ate. They were cast out. Adam and Eve's son kills their other son. And even after that, Adam begat sons and daughters, but 
he lived to the age of 930, which is a long time, but we're told he died. And so death has passed on to all mankind, and we also die. God has kept both his promise and his warning. In Genesis, the fifth chapter, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Then later in verse 13, God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Another situation where God sees that in the course of time, the wickedness of man become great, it grieved him, and he made a promise to Noah that the end of all flesh had come before him, both of man and beast and creeping thing. And he says that he intends to bring a flood upon the earth and he sets in motion having Noah build the ark to save himself, his wife, their three sons and their wives, along with many of the air-breathing animals that were on the earth. So we have the promise made and the warning to Noah that the flood was coming. Genesis 7, 18, the flood came and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and cattle and of beast, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. Another promise made, Another promise kept from the God of Israel. In Genesis 18, verse 20, God uh, speaks there concerning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, or the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come up unto me. And if not, I will know. God begins to oversee or to see uh, the cities of the plain, especially Sodom and Gomorrah, although there were other cities that was in the great plain. <coughs> Excuse me. And so God goes to check to see if their sin is great. And uh, he promises Abraham in the 18th chapter that he will uh, destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we see Abraham negotiating uh, with the Lord for the sake of those who are righteous. And they come to a agreement with each other. But in Genesis 19:24, uh, not having found sufficient 
to save the city. We're told the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Speaking concerning Lot's wife, she looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. They were warned to leave not looking back. And she looked back to become a pillar of salt. So we see that God promised to destroy them for their sins, much like he had destroyed the world previously. If there weren't enough righteous people there. And there weren't. And God did. And he had also warned them not to even so much as look back as they left the city. And she looked back and was punished for that. More warnings, more promises, and more faithfulness of God in keeping both the things that he warned them about and the things that he promised. In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and verse 15, God told the woman, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We've talked about this before in our previous lessons, but this is the first accepted prophecy and promise of a coming deliverer, the Messiah, the Christ, who would deliver people from the bondage of sin and the power of death. And that would come through the seed of a woman. The seed of woman would bruise the head or crush the head of Satan as he attempted to bruise the heel of man. Later on, 1 John 3 and 8, John says, He that commit, committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. A promise made in Genesis 3.15 that even though they had sinned, there would be power that would come through the seed of the woman who would destroy the works of the devil. John speaks of that as having been fulfilled here in these passages. In Genesis 22, beginning in verse 16, he is speaking to Abraham, making another promise. And notice what he says, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. Now, having nothing greater, as the book of Hebrews tells us, uh, he swore by himself, because thou hast done this thing, which was the willingness to offer up Isaac, his son, as God had requested, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. One of the promises that God made to Abraham was that his descendants would be as the stars of the heaven or as the sands of the seashore. And we've looked at the uh, people of Abraham. We know there was Isaac, and through Isaac became, uh, came Jacob. And Jacob was Israel, who was the head of of the 12 tribes, 12 sons. But we've also seen there were other sons born 
to Abraham that through their descendants, multitudes of people like the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea have came to inhabit the earth. So we have a, two promises really made here that Abraham's descendants would be many and great and that through his descendant, all nations of the earth would be blessed. That becomes the promise of the people of God that, as we saw in Genesis 3.15, that a deliverer would come. Paul speaks of this promise made to Abraham about a deliverer in Galatians 3, beginning in verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles or the nations through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not unto seeds as of many, but as one unto thy seed, which Paul says, is Christ. So God made the promise of Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the world, the Gentiles, would be blessed. And we see that with the coming of Jesus Christ, the preaching of the gospel in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost to the Jew first, and then in Acts 10. Peter takes the gospel to Cornelius, the beginning of taking the gospel to the nations. Throughout the book of Acts, we see that the various apostles uh, were doing missionary journeys, bringing the blessings of salvation to all the Gentile people, to all the nations. A promise made and a promise kept. In the book of Genesis, chapter 49 and verse 10, the promise was made to Joseph that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, till Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. This is another prophecy that we've already looked at, but the scepter is a sign of reigning and ruling. and That was to be through Judah, and that would continue until uh, the bringer of peace, Shiloh, would come, and then the gathering of the people to him. This is also a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. Judah was the tribe of which David and Solomon and others ruled and reigned over the people of Israel and Judah. And a descendant of that, the final one coming who would sit on David's throne and rule forever, and all would be gathered was Jesus. And Peter tells us in Acts, the second chapter, that. God hath made that same Jesus whom they crucified, both Lord and Christ. And he raised him from the dead to sit on his own right hand in the heavens. And so Judah was promised that through him would be the ones who would reign over the nation until Shiloh, or we know him, as Jesus, the Prince of Peace, would come. Galatians 4, verse 4, the Apostle Paul says, 
But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. As we look at this verse, it talks about the fullness of time. God made a promise to Judah and to the nation of Israel. He confirmed that over and over again. But when the time was right, when everything was as it should be, he sent forth his son, Jesus, made of a woman, of the seed of woman, made under the law, the promises made under the law, beginning in Genesis 3 and verse 15 and various prophecies, 300 and some. Uh, we list them there on our resource page if you want to go and look. But all of these various promises, prophecies, but in the book of Genesis, not only do we find a historical aspect of things that took place prior to the children of Israel's going into Egyptian bondage. We have the history of the creation of man and woman. We have the time before the flood, the time after the flood of the patriarchs and God's chosen people, Israel. There's a lot of historical aspect to the book of Genesis, but going along with that history, we see a series of prophecies, promises, warnings, and we see that when God speaks, he should be listened to and be obeyed because God keeps his promises. God does not falter in those things. So in the lesson today of Genesis, we ask, who can we trust? And we most definitely can and should trust God in his word. And so as preachers and teachers and Bible students, as we read and study the books of the Bible, and as we go through the book of Genesis, uh, we need to encourage ourselves and to encourage our loved ones and our congregations to trust in God because God does not lie. Not only in the book of Genesis do we find promises made, warnings made and kept, but we'll also see that throughout the book of the Bible that. Uh, that God keeps the promises that he makes continually, that his word is strong, steadfast, and sure, and we can trust in his word. And especially today, we ought to be able to trust in the New Testament because God kept the promises that he made in the Old Testament helps us to understand in the book of Revelation when we speak of a new heaven and a new earth and all of those promises. When God says, right, these things are true and faithful, we can truly believe and accept the things that God says. Jesus, in the book of John 14, made that great promise. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let's put our trust in God and the unchanging nature of his promises so that we might have that hope that the Hebrew writer speaks of in 
Hebrews 6, that is both sure and steadfast, that we through the stormy trials of life can wait and trust and look for that hope and that great promise God has made that one day we will dwell with him in heaven. As we prepare to close this morning, we're going to go to God in prayer, and then we'll open it up to questions if there are any. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace. We're so thankful, Father, to have a God like you who will warn us of the dangers that are ahead and will keep the promises that he has made. And Father, let us trust in your word. Let us heed your warnings that we need not suffer. Let us be faithful and true to your word so that when this life is over, heaven can be your home. Father, be with the sick, the afflicted, the hurting. We know, Father, the world is filled with much need. As always, Father, we pray that you will Grant a measure of your grace sufficient unto that need. We pray, Father, that you will be with us in this day. Walk with us as we walk with you in this life. And when this life is over, Father, give us a place with you in heaven, we pray. In Jesus' name, and amen. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, Perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.